Sherry Rasmussen was born on February 7, 1957. Sherry was living in Van Nuys, California, outside of Los Angeles, and was a much-loved nurse at the Glendale Adventist Medical Center. She was described as thoughtful, sympathetic, and friendly, and was said to be the life of the hospital where she worked. Sherry had entered college at the age of 16, and by her late 20s, was the director of nursing at the hospital, giving presentations and teaching classes for fellow nurses. In 1984, Sherry met 27-year-old John Rutten, a computer engineer, and about a year later, the couple married and moved into an apartment together. But a crazy ex-girlfriend of John's would wreak havoc in their lives, and John didn't help matters. His ex, LAPD officer Stephanie Lazarus, met John during college, and the two had an on-and-off-again relationship. However, John only considered Lazarus a friend with benefits and was never truly serious about her. But Lazarus was obsessed with him, and although she knew John wasn't dedicated to her, she never let that change her feelings. So, when Lazarus discovered that John was engaged to Sherry, she didn't take the news well. Lazarus asked John to come over and begged him not to marry Sherry, revealing that she loved him. But when John said he had to leave, she asked if they could be together one more time, which he agreed to. But that would make matters worse and cause Lazarus to become even more obsessed. Soon after, she showed up at their home wearing revealing workout clothes holding her skis. She asked John to wax them, and despite Sherry's objections, he complied. After she left, Sherry asked if their relationship was truly over, and John convinced her the two were just friends. A few days later, after John left for work, Stephanie returned to pick up the waxed skis, in uniform and armed. Sherry pleaded with her fiancé to tell Lazarus to stop coming by. John said there was nothing to their relationship and asked Sherry to ignore her. But over the next few weeks, Lazarus kept visiting Sherry and John for random chores. While Sherry had had enough of her fiancé's ex-lover in her life, she was scared to complain because Lazarus was in the police force, making her feel powerless and hopeless. According to Sherry's father, Nels Rasmussen, Lazarus later visited Sherry at her office in the hospital to tell her that things were not over between her and John and threatened that no one could have him if she couldn't. In addition, she told Sherry that John had slept with her two days earlier. Sherry was afraid of Lazarus but forgave John, and the couple was married in November 1985. But that didn't stop her from stalking and harassing Sherry. A few months after the wedding, on the morning of February 24, 1986, John left the couple's condo on Balboa Boulevard in Van Nuys to go to work. Sherry was scheduled to give a motivational speech at work that day, but called in sick instead. John tried to call Sherry later to check on her, but she never answered or returned his call, which was very unusual for her. When John came home from work, he noticed the garage door open, broken glass on the driveway, and Sherry's car was missing. When he entered the condo, Sherry was dead and had been attacked and shot. The entire apartment was ransacked with shattered glass, and items were strewn throughout. Even the appliances were out of place. It appeared that Sherry had put up a fierce fight with her killer. Authorities collected blood samples, bite mark swabs, and fingerprints from the crime scene. Earlier in the day around noon, two gardeners in the compound found Sherry's purse. Also, a maid cleaning a nearby unit said she heard something that sounded like two people fighting and then something falling at around 12.30 p.m. During the investigation, the police discovered that only the couple's marriage license and the BMW he bought for Sherry as an engagement gift were missing. The lead detective quickly concluded that two men committed the murder as part of a botched robbery, and nothing said by her friends and family would change that perspective. The theory was that the robbers didn't know that Sherry was home, and when they saw her in the apartment, they attacked her. But many aspects of the crime were improbable for a break-in especially one committed in daylight. Sherry's jewelry box was in plain view on top of her dresser and didn't appear to have been touched. The condo was in the middle of a gated complex, surrounded by other units from which burglars could have expected to be easily observed. The front door had an alarm warning and was never forced open. The BMW was found abandoned a week later, but yielded no new evidence. 
The medical examiner found the bite mark unusual, as bites during struggles are much more commonly inflicted by women, while most burglars are men. But still, detectives stuck to their burglary theory. The police searched for two men who were suspects in a theft case, and while there was no evidence to tie them to the murder, they continued to pursue them. Sherry's parents knew about some of the crazy things that Lazarus had said and done to Sherry and repeatedly asked the police to look into her, but the police wouldn't consider the possibility of her involvement. John quit his job and moved away from Los Angeles shortly after the murder. However, Lazarus's journal entries provided some interesting information. She noted that she missed John so much that she was ready to do anything to get him back. She had convinced herself that she should separate Sherry and John to be happy. Despite the crazy backstory involving Lazarus, Sherry, and John, the police never bothered to check on Lazarus. They didn't even consider her as a suspect. Instead, they would dismiss the idea whenever her name came up. Over the months, there was no progress in Sherry's murder case. With no other leads, the case would go cold, and the police would move on to other cases. But Sherry's parents were determined and never gave up. They made it their goal to get justice for their daughter, Sherry. They often urged the police to continue with the investigation and believed their daughter's case could be solved with the new DNA technology. However, when Sherry's father requested a DNA test, the police rejected his plea. They claimed they had no budget, suspects, or time to work on the case. Even when Sherry's father offered to pay for the process, they didn't agree. For some reason, the police were no longer interested in the case. In the meantime, Lazarus continued working with the LAPD and went on to start her own private investigation firm, Unique Investigations. In 1987, she earned medals, including one gold, at the World Police and Fire Games in San Diego. Three years later, she married a fellow officer and adopted a daughter with him. She would ultimately move back to Simi Valley, California, and became an instructor at the police academy. John eventually remarried as well, but didn't pressure the police like his former father-in-law. Meanwhile, the Rasmussens said the detectives at the Van Nuys office continued to be unhelpful and even hung up on them and sometimes put them on hold for long periods of time. Finally, a year after the murder, the frustrated family reiterated their offer at a press conference and called for more action. Nels wrote to Daryl Gates, then chief of the LAPD, about the possibility that Lazarus might have been involved. However, detectives told him he watched too much TV, but that didn't deter Sherry's father, and he was relentless for over two decades that he was never going to let anyone forget about the injustice his daughter suffered. In 2004, an LAPD lab technician, Jennifer Francis, noticed Sherry's file, and it intrigued her, and she started looking into it. She saw that Sherry's arm had a bite mark and wanted to run tests on it, but when she went looking for the evidence, it was missing. The evidence could not be located in department files, suggesting the samples were intentionally lost. Only the bite swab was located, which she found hidden in the coroner's freezer a week later. Jennifer sent the bite impression for testing and discovered it belonged to a woman, proving the theory of two male robbers wrong. She then went to the lead detective from 18 years ago for information on the case. She asked about the suspects and why Sherry's father pushed to inquire about an LAPD officer. The detective disregarded her questions and asked her to drop the case. So Jennifer moved on from her investigation, but would later find numerous other discrepancies in evidence that had been covered up, destroyed, or manipulated. By 2009, crime in LA had declined enough from its earlier levels that detectives began looking into cold cases to increase their clearance rates. A cold case detective read Sherry's case file and found it interesting. The fact that several things didn't add up kept nagging him. The squad reopened the case and started looking into the suspects and pieces of evidence again. They came up with five female suspects. They quickly eliminated four suspects, leaving only one woman, Stephanie Lazarus. Questioning Lazarus would take a lot of work because she was a high-profile police officer and a very aggressive person. She had a lot of connections, and one mistake could have dire consequences. 
The detectives started secretly looking into her. No paper trail or digital records were maintained, and they took immense caution to find even the slightest details. Finally, they got the proof they needed after secretly obtaining a used soda can from her and sent it off for DNA testing. The test results were a match, and the detectives quickly worked on getting a warrant. Knowing that arresting her wouldn't be easy, the police staged a fake interview in the LAPD headquarters and asked Lazarus for help. They did this because she had to submit her guns before entering the building. Initially, Lazarus needed clarification about the situation because she was told she would need to interview a suspect. But little did she know, the detectives were actually interrogating her. I mean, well, are you guys, is this something, I mean, you said I was going to interview somebody about art and how well, you guys are. Here's, here's, <laughs> I mean. Stephanie, here's the situation. It's basically, we... You know, we knew that this, when we saw this in the in, in this chrono, that maybe, you know, there was some relationship there. That's what the chrono seemed to indicate. And we didn't want to come up to you at your desk and ask those kinds of questions or do anything. You know how up there people can see what's going on if you go into an interview room or people are in there getting oh, supplies. Okay. I mean, so we, we wanted to afford you some privacy, some confidentiality okay. to talk about this because we thought it might be, you know, something, you know, you're married to someone else, obviously, and so forth. And that you may not want to, you know, talk about these things in that setting where someone, you know, we don't want the rumor mill or gossip or any of that kind of stuff I mean, to start. That's fine. I mean, so we're, we're, we did this just as, as a means to try and speak to you okay, in just a confidential I mean, just place where you, you know, where where your business isn't out there for other people in, in well, you know, I mean, your division yeah, to know about. I mean, you know, God, that's been a million years ago. I mean, you know, um, what year is it now? 2009? I mean, I graduated in 82. 82, mm. yeah. Um, you know, we dated, um, I dated other guys, I'm sure he dated other girls. Um. When the officers asked her about her connection with John and Sherry, she talked as though she didn't know them. She described her relationship with John as if it didn't matter to her. Yet, when the detectives asked for her DNA sample, she acted defensively and tried to sidetrack the investigation. Well, I know, but I mean, I you mean, know you're, not, you're not under arrest. You can walk out. You can leave you whenever you like. Well, but, you know, I, I'm trying to give you some background of you know how I knew him, and now you're telling me that some somebody's saying that we had this big old fight, and I don't even know what you're talking about, um, you know, and I don't want to you know get in trouble for something that I didn't even do, or you're saying I did something. Okay. Yeah, we understand. I mean, how would you guys like it if the tables were turned on you? I understand. No. Um, no, that's what we're telling you. I mean, you're free to go whenever you want. If if this makes you uncomfortable and you want to, well, you wanna now you're starting leave. to make me uncomfortable. The thing is, I mean, detectives did what they could at that time on the crime scene. Okay, and the burglary thing you're talking about—that is an angle that they looked at. Angle, but now we're looking at everything else on the case because nobody was ever arrested <laughs> on the case. I I don't know that or not. Okay. Now, what we'd like to do is, obviously, you know about all the DNA stuff and things of the nature that, you know, gets done on cases nowadays. You know, if we asked you for a, a DNA swab, would you be willing to give us one? Maybe. Because <laughs> now, 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 yeah, because now, now I'm thinking I probably need to talk to a lawyer. Okay. I mean, well, I because I know how this stuff works, okay? Don't get me wrong. You're right. I have been doing this a long time. Yeah. And, and I wish I had been recording this because... Because now it sounds like, you know, there's, you know, you're selling these people, say I'm fighting with her, and now <sighs> it sounds like you're trying to, you know, I've been doing this a long time. Yeah, we know. Okay? And it, and now it almost sounds like you're trying to pin something on me. No, now I, I got that sense. Well, what it gets to on these on these cases, and you know it as well as I do, our job is to identify and eliminate suspects. I can't believe this. So if we ask you to the point to give us a DNA sample, a buccal swab, so we can identify or eliminate you, would you be willing to do that? Maybe. Because well, I know this. I, 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 I well, that's where we're at, too. I mean, because right now, from looking at the evidence, it's, you know, it's possible we may have some DNA at the location. That's great. And we're going to do what we can to try to put this thing together. And your name's in the book. These people are pointing at you for whatever reason. <laughs> I don't know why. And that's just crazy. I mean, that's just, that's absolutely crazy. And... It would be irresponsible on our part not to look at it. I know. You guys have to do your job, and, and I guess I'm going to have to contact somebody. So That's fair. I mean, because I, I know how this stuff works. Sure. I mean, I, 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 I just can't believe it.
That's, I, I mean, we, we understand that. I mean, if we were in your position, I mean, we would feel the same way. I just can't even believe it. I mean, it's just... By the end of an hour-long interview, the officers arrested Stephanie Lazarus. She was charged with first-degree murder, and because she was a high-profile police officer and a significant flight risk, her bail was set at $10 million. Throughout the trial, Lazarus maintained her innocence. The prosecution theorized that on February 24, 1986, Lazarus picked the lock on Sherry and John's door and entered the condo. When Lazarus saw Sherry, she fired a shot from her 38 caliber revolver, hitting a window. Sherry ran, but Lazarus ran after her. The two struggled in a fight to the death. Sherry was taller than Lazarus and strong, but Lazarus was a police officer trained for combat. She bit Sherry on the forearm, causing her to let go of a sleeper hold she had on Lazarus, who then smashed a vase on her head. Sherry stopped struggling after being struck in the head with the butt of her revolver. Lazarus then wrapped a blanket around the pistol's barrel to act as a silencer and then fatally shot Sherry. Once Sherry died, Lazarus got to work, making the murder look like a home invasion and robbery gone wrong. She knocked over her furniture, pulled out the drawers, and stacked a VCR and CD player as if the alleged robbers escaped what they intended to steal in the house after murdering Sherry. Lazarus remained a free woman and a police officer for 26 years after the murder, but she was ultimately found guilty and sentenced to 27 years in prison and an additional two years for the illegal use of firearms. The Rasmussens tried to sue the LAPD for police negligence, but the statute of limitations prevented them from doing that. Although John was never a suspect, he also was not forthright with police about what had previously happened with Lazarus. In 1989, a few years after Sherry's murder, John began briefly sleeping with Lazarus again. Interestingly, the detective's notes show that John had called and asked if he was sure there was no evidence linking Lazarus with his late wife's death. Alyssa Turney was born on April 3, 1984, and lived in Paradise Valley, Arizona. At the age of 17, she lived with her stepfather, Michael Turney, and her half-sister, 12-year-old Sarah Turney. Her mother, Barbara Strom, died of cancer when Alyssa was eight, and then Michael legally adopted her. Michael also had three sons who were already out of the house by that time. Their home had a passive recording system that recorded all phone calls coming in and going out, and surveillance cameras that automatically recorded to VHS tapes. One camera was hidden in the living room vent facing the couch, and another was in their driveway, capturing the main door used for the home. James Turney, one of Michael's sons, wanted to give Alyssa and Sarah a place to stay after their mother's death. He didn't feel like their father was treating the girls right and was generally afraid for their safety. Michael's behavior showed that he needed constant control and dominance over Alyssa. On May 17, 2001, Michael dropped Alyssa off at school for the last day of her junior year of high school. He then picked her up and took her to lunch. They then allegedly got into an argument during the meal because Alyssa was asking for more privileges in the home. When they arrived home, Alyssa was very upset and went straight to her bedroom. Michael then claims he left to run an errand at 1 p.m. and then went to pick up Sarah. He says when they returned home, they found a note in Alyssa's bedroom which read that she was running away to California and he quickly reported her missing. Alyssa had been looking forward to attending a graduation party that same night but would never arrive. The police didn't initially suspect foul play and believed she had just run away. But strangely, her cell phone and other belongings remained behind, including $1,800 in her bank account. Seven days later, Michael claimed that he received a phone call from a payphone in California. He said Alyssa swore at him and then hung up the phone. Despite the recording devices around the house, there was no video or audio from Alyssa's last day in the home or from the phone call he allegedly received from her. He stated that all of those devices had strangely failed. 
He also said that he did have the video surveillance from Melissa's last day, but refused to give it to the police, stating there was nothing of interest on the tape. The year before her disappearance, Michael called Child Protective Services to tell them that if Alyssa ever filed a child molestation complaint against him, she was lying. He said the cameras and recording devices were for security reasons, not so he could observe his children's activities. Four years before her disappearance, Sarah made a home video of Alyssa and her father in which Alyssa comments about Michael being a pervert, causing him to quickly shut off the camera. Hit the red button. Why? Hit the red button now. I don't want to. I don't record. Hit the red button. Sarah! I'm recording. Sarah! Sarah! Dad's a pervert. Yes, sir. Give me the camera now. <laughs> And you're still recording. And Lisa is stupid moron. There's also a video of him sitting in his car in a parking lot, filming Alyssa while she's working at a restaurant. Six years later, in 2006, self-proclaimed serial killer Thomas Albert Heimer told a corrections officer that he had killed Alyssa. But when Phoenix police questioned him, they determined that he had never had any contact with Alyssa, and he admitted he might have confused her with a different victim. Heimer's story brought renewed attention to Alyssa's case. In addition, friends and family who had allegedly never been initially contacted by police in 2001 began to make disturbing allegations to authorities concerning Michael's relationship with his stepdaughter. Her sister said it finally forced them to look at the case again. In 2008, investigators from the Phoenix Police Department Missing Persons Unit opened Alyssa's case and declared that foul play was a factor in her disappearance. Michael then changed his story and claimed that Alyssa was killed by two assassins from the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers and that she was buried in Desert Center, California. At that point, Michael would become the primary suspect in the case. Authorities raided his home and seized 19 high-caliber assault rifles, two handmade silencers, a van filled with gasoline cans, and 26 handmade explosive devices filled with gunpowder and roofing nails. It was the largest stockpile of explosives ever discovered by the Phoenix Police Department. They also found a 98-page manifesto titled Diary of a Madman Martyr, outlining his plans for a rampage against the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers in Phoenix. According to the document, Michael worked as an electrician in the 1980s and complained about workplace conditions. The document states that he planned to blow up the Union Hall in revenge and unalive himself in the process. Michael was arrested, prosecuted, and sentenced to 10 years in jail after pleading guilty to possessing 26 unregistered explosives, but was released seven years later in 2017. In August 2020, Michael Turney was finally arrested, indicted, and charged by a grand jury on second-degree murder charges in the death of Alyssa. There's an amazing podcast about this case that Alyssa's sister does herself. It's called Voices for Justice. Once, while questioning her father about Alyssa's disappearance, he finally told her that he would give her all the honest answers on his deathbed. He said, be at the deathbed, Sarah, and I will give you all the honest answers you want to hear. He also said he would confess to everything if the state agreed to give him a lethal injection within 10 days. At the age of 53, Captain James Tappan Hall was a special deputy sheriff for Montgomery County, Maryland, and was a married father of two and had four grandchildren. He also worked part-time security for the Manor Country Club in the 14,900 block of Carrollton Road in Rockville, Maryland. On October 23, 1971, after 10.30 p.m., Captain Hall interrupted a burglary in progress at the country club. He had encountered two burglary suspects in the parking lot and attempted to arrest them. 
Unfortunately, the suspects were armed and would end up shooting Captain Hall. The country club's drink machines had been broken into and a house nearby had been robbed. Items stolen from the home were found near Captain Hall's body in the country club's parking lot, along with his service weapon that had never been fired. Captain Hall was taken to the hospital but would succumb to his injuries three days later. Police were unable to track down his killer and the case went unsolved for the next 51 years. That is until 2021 when detectives from the cold case unit decided to review the case with fresh eyes on the 50th anniversary of the murder. Detective K. Leggett and Corporal L. Killen re-examined old files and witness interviews until they narrowed the search down to one man, Larry David Smith, also known as Larry David Becker. He had been interviewed in 1973, but was never labeled a suspect. He soon moved to Little Falls, New York, and in 1975, he ditched the last name Smith and changed it to Becker. 71-year-old Smith was interviewed on September 1, 2022, and admitted he shot Captain Hall, but claimed it was an accident and said he didn't even know he had died. With Becker's confession in hand, he was arrested later that day and charged with the murder of Captain James Tappan Hall. Thank you.